uh, that everybody really use. And I see people from this public sector who already heard this are not here, which is good. I don't have to hear this again. Um, yeah, so to be more precise, it's not just attacks, it's attacks using decoding failures. And uh, I'm sure all of you were awake when, Rams, when, when Alan presented Ramstake crypto system, but uh, we'll have a little refresh on that um, to get everybody up on the line. And uh, we'll also look at the best currently known attack on Ramstake. And after that, we'll, we'll take a look at the decoding failures and how we can perhaps improve this best attack. And then we'll conclude with some open problems. Now, first of all, we're not doing any crypto systems. We're going to look at the key encapsulation mechanism. So we'll always be with those three polynomial time algorithms. So the key generation, which outputs a public and a secret key pair. The encapsulation, which uh, takes the public key and encodes or encapsulates some kind of symmetric key and outputs the ciphertext and the secret key, uh, the, the symmetric key. And uh, in the end, the decapsulation, which takes the ciphertext and the secret key and, uh, well, decapsulates or de decrypts the ciphertext with the secret key and outputs the symmetric key. Um, now, we don't just want to do any encryption system. We want to do that with Mersenne numbers. So first of all, we need a Mersenne number. Or in our case, that will be Mersenne prime. So a prime of the form 2 to the power of n minus 1. And literally all the calculations or terms will be in ZPZ, but I think the slides do not carry the, the mod P always, but just assume pretty much everything is in there, most of the things, unless stated otherwise. Um, the second thing is we want to work with or attack the scheme of decoding failures, so we also want an error correcting code that can uh, correct up to a certain number of errors. And then we also need some kind of encryption or encapsulation function. In our case, we will um, encrypt our symmetric key with a one-time pet or with a stereo noisy one-time pet. And we'll also have a lot of nice colored squares. Well, I guess not so much colored, but it's black and white. And um, we'll have two kind of numbers, basically. The first one will be the lowercase numbers, which is sparse integers. Uh, with low Hemingway, that means the number of ones in the binary expansion is comparably low. So the number of one are the, the ones are represented by the black dots, and the zeros are represented by the white squares. And then below we have the uppercase numbers, uh, uppercase letters, which will always be uh, non-sparse integers or binary strings. Okay, so we can build a key encapsulation mechanism out of this. Um, we have Alice, which takes some two secret sparse integers a and b, and a non-sparse integer d, and she computes uh, a times g plus b, and g and this public component will be published. In order to do a encapsulation, Bob will also pick two sparse integers c and d, and some secret symmetric key, or in our case, it will be a, a seed. And uh, he compares, computes his own uh, one-time pet, or a shared noisy one-time pet, by taking the public component of Alice and multiplying it with this secret C. Then the seed is encoded using the error corrected code, and the noisy one-time pet is applied to the encoded seed to get out the ciphertext. Then, additionally to the ciphertext, Bob also needs to compute a public component, which is uh, Again, the non-sparse part of Alice um, multiplied and added up with uh, his secret sparse integers. Now, if Alice wants to decapsulate the ciphertext, she again takes the public component of Bob, um, multiplies it with the first secret sparse integer, and gets out this shared one-time pet, or noisy one-time pet. Then she applies the one-time pet to the ciphertext, uh, throws everything into the error corrected code and hopefully gets out the same seed uh, that Bob encapsulated before. Okay, why does this work? Well, we can take a look at the shared noise one-time paths, which is always denoted as no TP, so I forgot to add that. Um, 
well, Bob has the shared noise one time at ACG plus AC, and Alice ACG plus AD, and we see that like AB and C and D are all sparse and short, and G is the only big big component or the big the only non-sparse component, and while the snow GPs match on ACG, which is like the most number of ones in the binary expansion, and all the errors are basically introduced by B and C or A and D. And uh, B and C and A and D together um, add less than T errors in a certain part, then the error correcting code can do its work and uh, well, both parties end up with the same, same C. And, uh, and we can take a look at why we think it's safe or why certain people think it's safe. Um, well, given all the, the public components, which is the public key of Alice, G, A, G, and A, G plus E, and the public component of Bob, um, it is, if, apparently it's difficult to find some binary string S such that the Hamming distance between this S and either one of the shared noise one-time pads is less or equal than T. So it's hard, hard to find one of the noisy one-time pads without knowledge of uh, A, B, R, C, and E. Okay, now we want to build RAM stack out of this. So basically we do the exact same thing as before, but we add uh, re-encryption and de-randomization. Um, yeah, so first in the, in the key generation, we take the, the parameters A, B, and G. We don't just pick them somehow, but we actually derive them deterministically from some seed, from some pseudo-random process. Um, we compute the public key and the secret key as is. Um, then in the encapsulation, the parameters C and D are also derived deterministically from some kind of seed that Bob picked. Um, the ciphertext is computed the same way. We compute some kind of symmetric key, which is just the hash of the public key and the seed that we use to derive our parameters. Um, we are computing additional C and uh, we'll output the ciphertext, the public component, the hash, and the key for Bob. And uh, while in the decapsulation, we just do the normal decoding, and after that we do the re-encryption, so um, we recompute all the parameters from the encapsulation function using the seed that we decoded and the public key, and we get some new parameters prime, and if the parameter, the prime parameters match with the parameters that we received from Bob, then everything is okay and we can output the, C, uh, the, the key. And if uh, something went wrong, for example, the decoding failed, then uh, the parameters were not matched, and we rejected the output. Okay, so the best known attack is the slice and dice attack, or some people also call it partition and try. I think the people still are not sure what it's named. Um, and the goal is to find the, to, well, from the position of the encapsulator, find the secrets A's and B's, given just the public component and G. And I don't really want to look at this in detail. Um, all we need to know is that basically we, we just look at the binary extension of A and B. Um, we pick a, a partition, or we partition A and B into subranges, process this somehow, feed it into LLL, um, and repeat until we pick a correct partition, and LLL will somehow return our secrets. And the runtime for this is approximately, so the, the probability to, to pick a correct partition is like 2 to the power of minus 256. Um, well, and so a partition is correct if all the ones in the binary expansion of either A and B fall into the least significant half. So this is, let's say, A, and the black box are all the, all the ones. Since it's sparse, um, we just have to find a partition such they all fall in the least significant half. And given such a partition, we can just um, break or find A and B in polynomial time. And um, well, this is actually really good because we don't really need to know the position of A and B, but if we just know them with an offset of, let's say, 30 or 40 bits, so let's say the considerably approximate positions, we can already use those positions to, um, yeah, to break the, the system. Yeah, so all you have to take away is if we can find the partitioning such that all of the bits fall into the least significant half of the secret, then um, 
in the least even half of the parts, then we can, can break everything. Uh, yeah, so why, why do we consider deconic failures? Um, well, a deconic failure appears obviously if all the sparse integers a, b, c, and d, which also includes the secrets a and b, um, somehow mess up and introduce too many errors. Uh, so, with high probability, the decoding failure, when there are too many errors, will leak some kind of information about the secret keys. Um, it's just not always clear how to use that. Uh, and in the past, not all of the CCA security proofs included notion of, of decoding failures, so there have been there are some examples a little longer ago and some that are more recent of crypto systems that have been proven to be CCA secure, but uh, actually have been broken then using decoding failures. Uh, yeah, just a note at the side is that the, the proof for, for Ramstake, which is yet unpublished, uh, includes decoding failures. So, um, well, one could say that perhaps it's safe, maybe it's not. Um, anyway, so um, most of the, the or many of the encapsulation mechanisms with decoding failures have a rather high, um, or how, no, rather high, rather low probability of failure. Like, I don't know, 2 to the power of minus 100, 120, 200 or something. Um, but in the case of RAM sake, it's just 2 to the power of minus 64, which is considerably high. And therefore, it might be more prone to, to attacks with decoding failures. Um, yeah, so before we. Yeah, so first we'll just uh, define a weaker RAM stake. Um, by basically removing the derandomization and the re-encryption. So we take the position of the encapsulator, so we also start, uh, start changing things here. Um, we remove the derandomization, so the parameters C and D are not sampled deterministically anymore, but we can pick them in any way that we want now. And in the decapsulation, we don't, uh, we remove the re-encryption, so we don't re-compute our, uh, our the, the prime parameters from the decoded seed, but we just check if the seed was decoded correctly, and if it's uh, decoded correctly, we have good success, and if it's not, then we just we check the encapsulation. Um, so now we will try to attack the scheme, and then we will try or will think why our attacks cannot be lifted to the uh, to the CCA secure or to the to the actual RAM stake scheme. There are a couple of ways to attack this, or to, to learn about the secrets A and B. Um, there are probably also more than four, but we'll just stick with these four. Um, so the first possibility would be to find partitions for either A, B, or B and C. That would allow us to use the slice and dice attack, which would also give us A and B. Um, another option would be just to find the shared noisy one-time pad of the decapsulator which is really just uh, the secret parameter A times our public component, so it will also give us A and B directly, um, finding well, all, the, all the noise, all the noisy positions, which is AD plus minus BC, will also somehow lead us to the shared noisy one-time pad, and then of course also to the parameters. And the last strategy that we will try is just finding the positions of A and B somewhere directly. Right. Um, yeah, so let's recap what we want to do. Um, our goal is to find the random n bit secrets A and B in ZQZ with Hemming weight at most omega, which is sparse integers in our case, um, from at most, or from, from Q decoding failures. And in our weak scheme, we can choose C and D freely, and we can also choose our Stadmoise one time pet freely, because the reencryption will not fail anyway. Ah, well, because we removed the encryption. And um, so we'll try to, to incorporate two strategies, finding the state noise one time path, and the other one would be to find bits of uh, B directly. Um, I'm not really going to talk about the first one because it's a little lengthy and um, not so nice, but we just want to note that we can exploit some things um, by injecting artificial errors to it, extract the snow TP 
in less than to the power of 30 queries, and will therefore also find the secrets. All right, now to the other strategies. We take a look at the public component of Alice, and we know that A and B are both um, sparse integers, so they have uh, at most omega once in their binary expansion. So we just write that as a sum, we see that it's just the sum of, of powers of two. And um, what we want to do now is we want to pick a random x in z and z, so n is the bit length of, of a and b, or of all of our, of our uh, elements in our ring. And um, we'll try to, to distinguish if x is a, is a bit position in b or not. We do that by changing the public component of Alice. So we have a g plus b, and we subtract minus 2 to the power of x, um, ending up with a new shared noisy one time pad that is a little bit different. And then there are basically two possibilities. So the, um, the top row is basically the, the original shared noisy one time pad. And after our changes, we either, if x is a position, is a bit position in b then we effectively remove one of the errors introduced by B, C, and if X is not a bit position of B, then we effectively edit uh, more errors into our noisy one-time pad. Um, more errors means more decoding failures, and more decoding failures means if we query the encapsulation Oracle with enough, uh, enough samples, we can distinguish in which case we are. And of course, if we can distinguish in which case we are, we can um, distinguish if x is a bit position or not, and therefore we can find all of the positions of b. Um, and from b we can pretty much directly get a. Yeah, so how much queries do we need? Well, we have a decaps uh, failure probability of 2 to the power of minus 64, so 2 to the power of 64 queries. There are about 2 to the, 2 to the power of 20 bit positions. And then we also have some factor d, which we need to distinguish if x is a, if it's a bit position or not. And um, d is like 2 to the power of 10, so like 1,000 decoding values should be enough. Um, so it, we end up with around 2 to the power of 95 decapsulation queries, which we would need. OK, now we define the next problem. Um, which will be a little bit closer to the CCA, secure RAM stake. Um, so we have the same problem, we want to find the random secrets A and B. Um, we still choose our C and B freely, but this time um, we don't change the shape noisy one-time pad, but we compute it honestly from the public component and our secret C. We'll go again with the two strategies. The first strategy is finding the shared noisy one-time pad of Alice. And the second strategy is finding a partition of B and C and then improving the slice and dice attack of that. Okay, so um, when I told you that we apply the shared noise one time pad to the encoded seed, um, I guess I didn't tell you that the encoded seed is actually not as long as the shared noise one time pad. Um, it's like 2000 bits or something, and the shared noise one time pad is. 750,000 bits, so we only need uh, like the least 2,000 significant bits or something. And we'll just denote those that part as the encoding block. So we get a decoding failure, that also means that only the number of errors in this encoding block are, are too high. Um, now if we have a, the, the, the two snow TPs, they are all somewhat dependent on C and D, and if we take a CD and a C dash D dash or C prime D prime, um, where C prime is C times 2 to the power of 8, so like a, a rotation by one byte, then that also rotates the shared noisy one time pads, both of them, by exactly one byte. And if we take a look at our encoding block, then rotating by, by one byte means we move a new byte into the encoding block and we move some byte at the other end out of the encoding block. Now if we have a, a set of, of decode of, of, of C prime, D prime, and C prime prime, D prime prime, and so on, um, 
where each each new C and D pair of C and D is uh, like a, a rotation, um, and we queried out the decapsulation oracle with that. We get a list of like decoding failure, decoding success, and so on, depending on uh, the number of errors that we shift in or out of our encoding block. And uh, well, there is some way that we can distinguish if we either move the error into the block or move the non-error position in, into the block. And from that, we can um, query the 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 byte positions of the stepwise one time that. So if we move the, the position into the block, that was one of the noises, so it was a position of either EC or AD, and if it was a non-error byte, then we knew that the shared noisy one time pads matched, so it's a, we learned a byte of the shared noisy one time pad. Um, yeah, however, we were not able to get sufficient amount of bytes of the shared noisy one time pad to use that in any way, but with enough decoding failures, uh, one or and, and enough rotations, one can get approximately the positions of AD and BC, and then also just the positions of BC. And um, well, that can be used to improve the slice and dice attack. Um, it doesn't really make it fast, but at least uh, it's already improved by by its square root. On the classic computer. Right. Um, then we have the um, third problem, which represents uh, the problem of finding the secrets on the um, CCA secure RAM stake. So the, the secret parameters C and D are not chosen freely anymore, but they are derived deterministically from some kind of seed. Uh, and the standard noisy one time that is also computed honestly. Now, in the, in the past attacks, we, we either changed the snow TP or the public component or something, um, modified it in some way, or we managed to query um, query uh, encapsulation where our, our parameters were somehow related with each other. Now, unfortunately, changing the snow TP doesn't work anymore because then the re-encryption will fail all this. And if the re-encryption fails, we cannot really distinguish if it's so we cannot distinguish if it was a re-encryption that failed or the decoding error, so we cannot really learn anything out of that. Um, yeah, we can still query related C and D, but since our parameters are somehow derived from some pseudo-random process, um, it's very difficult to find such related C and Ds, so we can also not do that on purpose. And it's unlikely that um, we just randomly find related C and Ds. Uh, yeah, so it's not that easy to find a structural structural attack on the CCA secure RAM stake. And yeah, in fact, I didn't find any over the last five months. Um, however, the and the well, the current implementation is somewhat prone to timing attacks. Um, so if we have the encoding block. Uh, we always take the encoded seed and apply the, the one-time pad with the least significant bits of the of this node TP, right? And um, doing this once gives us a fairly high failure probability. So in order to achieve this failure probability of 2 to the power of minus 64, we have to do it six times. So six times the same uh, encoded seed, just with different parts of the of the shared noise one-time pad. And basically what what happens is, um, well, we use the fourth first code word, and then in the decapsulation, um, if the first code word decodes correctly, um, then the other five code words are not decoded anymore. Right? Um, if the first code word doesn't decode, um, the algorithm will try to decode the second code word. Um, that also fails on the third code word, and so on. Now we can, what we can do is we can fill the the last five code words honestly, which means they will decode with high probability, and we can fill the first code word with some malicious information. Uh, and then, well, if the malicious blocks decodes correctly, um, none of the other blocks decodes, so the decapsulation will finish in short time, and if the malicious block fails to decode, um, then all the blocks are decoded with high probability, and the decapsulation will take a long time. So we can distinguish if a 
this one block failed or not. And um, which also means we can now distinguish between, uh, between uh, re-encryption failures or rejections and decoding failures. And that basically allows us to, well, exploit all the previous attacks, uh, no injecting errors, um, changing the shared noisy one-time pad or whatever. Yeah, of course this is, well, well this is a problem that, that appears in the uh, implementation. I mean, you have a constant time implementation, this is not a problem anymore. And so far, RAMSA still remains secure. At least nobody published the attack yet. Um, yeah, so uh, I would have concluded with some kind of questions or some final things that would be really cool to have. Um, first of all, it would be really nice um, to know if there is some um, um, bit patterns for decoding failures. That means, uh, um, let's say, if you if you feed if you have your parameter C and D, and they have certain bit patterns, will certain well will certain bit patterns co uh, cause more decoding failures because they interact differently with the secrets A and B, right? Um, it would be also cool to have a parameter C and D that reveal patches of zeros in the secret. So I told you that if, it, if we know the approximate positions of A and B, uh, the bits bits of the ones in A and B, then we can can uh, break. This, the system put it on the time, right? But instead of knowing where the ones would are, it of course would also be no good to know where like large pets of zeros are. You know that I don't know the first uh, ten thousand bytes are all zero uh, bits are all zero. Then that will also help us to to improve the partition edge write attack. And uh, while well, the question is, can we somehow query a certain or given a certain C and D um, with a certain bit pattern, can we somehow imply that a certain patch of patch uh, patch of bits is zero. Um, well, then, in general, um, is it possible to just find C and D that cause more decoding failures? Um, and for this, running just some very basic um, tests by querying different C's and D's, it seems that well, C's and D's that are evenly spread all over the the range of our bit length cause more decoding failures than, I don't know, um, putting all the all the ones of C and D in like one corner or something. Um, but I couldn't really find a, a proper pattern. And then, uh, at last, of course, the most general question. Um, for the question, there are weak keys, so parameters A and B that cause more decoding failures in general, or perhaps that are, well, easy to partition in some way that, based on some decoding failures, uh, one can directly see how to partition it. Right, and with that, I would want to conclude my talk. And thanks for your attention. And of course, if there are any open questions, it's not a PhD defense, so. Yes? Um, how, so are there tight bounds on the parameters you can use to the decoding the succeeds? Uh, so early on, on about slide five, you had uh, you had to make sure the time distance was less than the bound on the code. Um, yes. So, what so, so do you have like uh, type bounds on the parameters of these things that you sample the ACB? Ah. Um, um, I'm, I'm not. So in in the instantiation, um, the Hamming weight of ACB and D is usually 128. Um, or just what's the probability then, then that that happens that you? Well, that's a pretty good question. Um, so in Ramsdake, nobody computed it exactly, but it's um, for a single code word. So for for a seed with 255 bytes encoded into uh, sorry, a seed with 32 bytes encoded into 255 bytes, the probability is like. Two to the power of minus thirteen, and that's why using six code words you get to something more than two to the power of minus sixty-four. Um, but the other merge encrypt system that's out there, uh, they use a little bit more sophisticated error correcting code, and they have a proven a proven failure probability of at least minus hundred twenty-eight. And experimentally, theirs is like two hundred forty-seven or something. And then they're not susceptible to that. Uh, 
code the timing attack? Right. Um, well, that only, only depends on the implementation. Um, but if you somehow would fix all of your snow, if all of your shared noisy one-time bet into one big error correcting code, um, then you would also not have that. Other questions? And let's thank the speaker one last time.